We have made our way through most of Galatians chapter 1. We are on the last two verses of chapter 1 of Galatians when the bell rang last week. I tried to talk quickly and get to the end of my notes for chapter 1 when we wrapped up, but we still didn't get to our, our last question. So our last question that was on the sheet last week has become our first discussion question this week. Uh, I've learned, though, that you don't just open it up for dialogue or discussion as soon as you get started. I've learned that lesson the hard way. A lot of times you really just get crickets when that happens. So our first question this morning is going to be the Jeffrey Dahmer question that you see at the top of the list there. But before we do that, let's, uh, let's turn to some passages for a better context and a reminder of where we left off last week. First off, we'll read verse 23 of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1 and verse 23 is really where we finished last Sunday. Galatians 1 verse 23 says, But they were hearing only, He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. Paul here is continuing his commentary on the churches of Judea that he refers to in verse 22. By way of reminder, Paul writes that he was unknown by face to the churches of Judea. They might not have known Paul personally, but they had likely heard stories of how he had persecuted Christians in the past and how he tried his hardest to destroy the church. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts 9, and we will look at verse 13 there. Acts 9, verse... 13. <clears throat> we referred to this verse last week, but I don't think we actually read it. Acts 9 and verse 13 says, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. So the Lord says to Ananias in a vision to go and see Saul of Tarsus, and Ananias didn't even want to go see Paul because of his reputation of bringing harm to those saints in the church. In the same chapter there, in chapter 9, drop down to verses 26 and 27. Verses 26 and 27 read, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had, how he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Remember from our lesson last week that three years had actually passed between the verse we just read there in verse 13 of 9 and then down here in verse 26. Three years had passed between these verses. In verse 26, we see that the apostles were afraid of Paul. And then there at the start of verse 27, we see that it was Barnabas that actually reconciled Paul to the apostles there in Jerusalem. And I shared this right before the bell rang last week. Paul was a, was a known killer and persecutor of Christians. And I'm not able to really even think of a good analogy, but imagine we have a, a strange person show up uh, in our assembly and they're trying to haul people off or they're trying to harm people, or maybe this individual comes around enough that, or maybe he's with a congregation around us. We've, we've heard of this person at a surrounding congregation, and then, and then we hear, hear of this person, let's say that he's killed some member at, at a different congregation, but now he's been added to the church. So that's probably enough context for our first question. The first question I have on the sheet there is how difficult would it be for us to face this type of a situation? And the second question there, how well would we do at welcoming Jeffrey Dahmer with open arms here at Alcair Road? I know he's dead now, but go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I think this is exactly why God's kingdom is, is a body. All, everyone has different talents. Everyone's going through a different experience. Everyone's praying for different things. Um, and so, you know, like with Barnabas, he, uh, he was the one who was given the, the courage, the bravery, the, the mindset to approach Paul and, and do what was right with him. And it makes sense for everyone else to be scared of him because how else do you make decisions 
except for through experience and through what you know about a person. Um, and so, and so it's good that there's there's always going to be at least one person who's uh, maybe in the right place at the right time or in the right mindset. Um, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be you, but if you can be supportive to to the rest of the body, yeah. who is reaching out in all these different ways, then that's good. That's a healthy body. Okay. Got it. So that everybody has their part. Barnabas played his part in particular there. We see him help reconcile Paul to the, uh, the other apostles. Okay. Jimmy? Jason, what would be scarier was he had the authority to arrest them. Yeah. That, that makes a difference. I mean, you can get along with people, you know, maybe that done different things, but if they've got the authority to, to take you out and... You know, he had he had authority from the high priest. To, it was like like having no warrant for your arrest if you were a Christian, and so that would have been another thing too that would have been uh, would would have added to this. So they would just been scared, like he, not want, yeah. He not want to be around Paul because that's what Anna and I said. Hey, I've heard how he has arrested these people or has taken these people. He had the authority. For, he got these things from the high priest. Yep. To do this. I mean, that's what he was on the mission to do on the road to Damascus, was to go haul people off in the name of John. You know, I, I think sometimes, you know, living in our culture that we do, you know, we don't have maybe the mindset that the first century did, whereas, you know, they were in jeopardy of their lives oftentimes for professing Christianity. Um, and so, you know, what... What if that was our culture, you know, in today's society? I mean, you know, I, I wonder how faithful some of us would be, but also, you know, what, to me, the mindset of the church is to realize that it is God's institution. And I think sometimes we allow our personal feelings, uh, our thoughts to impede upon you know, God's design of the church. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure people that had this fear, you know, even maybe relatives where Paul had consented to the death of one of their relatives or kin, you know, they, they may have said, now, wait a minute. I, you know, if Paul, if Paul is going to be there at that congregation, I'm not going to I'm not going there. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, well, I especially he may have killed a relative or yeah. condoned the killing of a relative yeah. of theirs, and now he's come to that congregation potentially. Yeah, yeah. okay. And, uh, and, and I think that's where, you know, sometimes we may allow our own, you know, fears Human. to kind of, you know, maybe exclude someone in, in that instance. Um, but, you know, this is, this is Christ's church. Um, and, not man's. Yeah, yeah, it's not man's. It's not ours. And, and we need to be careful and be on guard of, you know, with us trying to limit, you know, people, uh, yeah. you know, being part of the congregation, even if that meant, you know, there was great fear. And I understand, you know, we need to be cautious of, you know, and, and, and protect the body as much as possible. But we also need to realize that, you know, in the first century, what, Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death. Even if it, it means, mean, yeah. you know, it, it meant that some of them. <laughs> that you might face death. They might yeah, face yeah, death, exactly. but they yeah. were still to be faithful in that instance. I remember, I don't know what class or what the topic was, but I remember Diane Taylor sharing that Isaac's situation was a, a far scarier one, where he had to essentially worship in private because he was at risk as well, and he had to do that at home. Tony? Yeah, I was just going to say, kind of, and what Michael said and what John's saying, we've got to also know that if you're committing some type of sin, there's consequences. So Paul's, Paul probably realized he's going to face consequences of that and how he acted. And I would say the people that John's talking about, if you're a family member, those people couldn't take vengeance on Paul. Right. Um, <clears throat> but they wouldn't have to have a relationship with Paul. They could forgive Paul. But there's a consequence for Paul's actions that he's going to have to deal with in that situation. Yeah. If, I, if I got drunk and killed a family, 
I've got consequences. Yep. Now, I can be forgiven of that, but I do have consequences. But I think that what Michael was talking about is the, the family, that there were people that maybe didn't have that experience. They're not that. attached to that. Yep. Attached yep. To that and they can, they can do that, and they can help that. And with the providence of God, obviously, Paul was used and, you know, grew the church. But I think we have to consider that also, that there are consequences to sinful actions. So I put, go ahead, Tammy. This is to a lesser degree, but I've had people tell me like that they need the prayers of the church and stuff and they want to go forward, but they don't want to go forward because they don't want other people like wondering what they've done or, or judging. They them. fear the consequences and, or, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Um, you know, so I think that it's our job when someone does go forward, you know, to restore them back and to not sit in comfort and, and, yeah, yeah. I was going to get back to Jeffrey Dahmer. So is everybody familiar with that story? So I, there was Phil Sanders, um, Church, Church of the Lord's Way. Heard him at some gospel meeting, and he was talking about, he went on, but basically at the very end of, of the sermon, you learn that Jeffrey Dahmer was converted by a church of Christ. I think it was a church of Christ related. I don't know. Um, at any rate, let's just... Let's say that was the case. Let's say Jeffrey Dahmer was a converted Christian in, in the true sense that we adhere to here, right? Um, let's say he got out instead of ended up dead, and he shows up at our congregation. Who's our what's that? He's in the part. He's in, He's number. He's number one. <coughs> and I, are you are you asking what's in his crock pot? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> All right, a little off the rails. So who, who is, who who's going to reconcile? I mean, do we have that same dilemma? Are are we going to go ahead? The extreme example. I mean, I think like what Tony said. There's consequences to what he did as in society. Um, that yes, we have to accept him in our church, but. There's no way we ever have to put ourselves in danger to welcome him. Christ gave us our brains to be able to make these decisions on who we allow our families around. Yes, he's involved and can do stuff, but there's, I mean, it's not just the regular old member coming in to let him do what, I mean. So you're, you're saying there's still going to be reservations? Yeah, for sure. And I don't think, I mean, God gave us a brain to be able to make decisions who we, you know, allow to make those choices. I'm not saying he's a castaway or anything right. like that, but there's... Well, take it, take it one further. If there's a convicted pedophile, we're not going to let him teach the children that class. Yeah. I mean... And there's going to be a man home in Baptist. Yeah. But we're going to... Yeah. You know, he can worship them. <clears throat> like Cole says, common sense. I just put the extreme one on there because it made me think... Would I would I be really good at welcoming that individual? Would I be really good at 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 having the love that I need to have for an individual like that? I have no emotional connection to the terrible things that individual did, but clearly we all have the knowledge of it. It was in the news in the '80s or '90s or whatever time frame that was. Um, then. Mine's more of a question, <laughs> but um, isn't there parts in the Bible where? Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul was told to cast certain people out of the church and to. That were still in sin, though, right? Yeah, I mean, you can't. It was a uh, Second Corinthians five where like, you can't be complicit with sinful things. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have to remember too. I mean, while it may be an uncomfortable situation, and you know. What he did is not a typical thing you hear about every day, which is a good. Yeah, um, thankfully. <laughs> you know, his, his sins were no worse than any other thing that any of us do every day. Sin is sin. And we have to, you know, we, we have to just remember that and, and remind ourselves and maybe each other of that and that it's God who knows whether he truly repented. Yeah. And it's our duty to accept him and 
you know, like I said, it, it could be awkward at, at first and kind of, uh, you know, knowing and having that knowledge of, of what had happened is never going to leave your mind. Yep. Um, but I, I'm sure that people would get to know him and, and start to fellowship and, and, and things that it would become easier and, and especially seeing him as a child of God and, and, and a brother in Christ. You, you can start to replace some of those thoughts that you have about him, you know, with other thoughts and experiences now that you have that are positive and, and try to, you know, just move forward. Um, I mean, Peter, for example, you know, he denied Christ. He, he messed probably up. probably wasn't yeah. at the cross. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's no record of him there. Um, but he was welcomed back. I mean, it would be hard to come back to a kind of, you know, to a group of people and say, yeah, I know what I did, but, you know, I'm sincere, I'm dedicated, I'm ready. They would be like, mm-hmm, sure you are. are yeah. You? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't there be questions in people's For minds? Sure. Yep. Um, but God knew his potential and he became an elder. Um, you know, some people might say, oh, he can never really be effective as a speaker or a preacher or, you know, any kind of leader. But obviously he was extremely yeah. effective. And sometimes knowing that a person has fallen and seeing them get up from that and overcome that is the most inspiring thing that can help people. Because they see Peter's not this perfect person. Yep. Um, you know, they can relate to the fact that he fell and sinned. And, um, He's he been there. He can understand. He can relate. To where yeah. they can see if he came back from that, what about my yep. sins? <clears throat> Surely I can be pleasing to God and, and, and be an effective speaker and teacher and whatever they want to be too. Absolutely. I know a lot of people consider Paul one of the greatest, if not the greatest Absolutely. apostle. But and he condoned the killing of Christians. If that question to those relatives that he consented to their death, that they would say the same thing. Yeah. You know, they may have a different light on Paul or different, what do you mean Paul's the greatest apostle? They, How dare you? Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know what he did yep. to my son, you know? <laughs> but they're still looking at it through the lens of... They are. Their yeah. family or, yeah. yeah. And, and not in, in how God sees the church and how, you know, as Sharon was saying, how he could use individuals like yeah. that to be highly effective in the church. Should we not give that same chance to those individuals that God? Would? Absolutely. We've taken Michael's uh, tattoo example to a whole new level with Jeffrey Dahmer. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, I think exactly what they were saying is um, all... All of us who are trying to be more like Christ every day, all of us who are trying to follow in his footsteps, um, trying to forgive and love people in the way that God would. Um, you know, we're all taking steps towards that every day, and, and we're all in different parts of that journey, different legs of the, the travel. Um, and if we see someone who has a very public, very, uh, by our consideration, extreme sin, um, it's up to us whether we want to take another step down that road of being, being loving and forgiving. Or if we're, if we're too afraid or not mature enough. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and we know that from God's perspective, he knew that Paul would accomplish all these great things. Um, but you have to take a step along that path to becoming closer to Christ to um, be willing to open up to that. I do think that's a good point. And even being able to do this effectively takes work. It takes effort. And sometimes it takes a lack of comfort. You know, uh, you know, even from a personal development standpoint, if you're completely comfortable, you're probably not growing. You have to push yourself out of your comfort zone to, to grow. Mark? Uh, this could be, I, I've been thinking about it, but I don't think it's real dangerous, but I think a, an easier example than the Jeffrey Dahmer aspect of it is for the, in the political realm. It's kind of like when one political, a person from one political party turns it goes into the other political party. Yeah. Case in point, in my recollect, this I have don't even Tulsi Gabbard is a she's a she used to be governor of Hawaii. Well, she was 
she was a democrat and gave left the democratic party and possibly could be trump's running mate mm. and i find myself you know like yeah but you know what, are you really a really, republican a yeah, right, yeah yeah you know, or, or, it's kind of that thing it's kind of like okay fine that's great whatever if she was Republican and switched to Democrat. It doesn't matter. I don't. I don't care about that. But it's just that aspect of somebody changing that much in their yep. personality and in their their beliefs that you're a little skeptical. Right. And it takes time. And, and you know, so it's kind of. It's more relatable, but I don't know that it's less controversial. Yeah, <laughs> See, Tony wants to say something now. I mean, we know he's a staunch Democrat. Well, we have a we have a real life example that happened a few years ago. We had the police officer that killed a member of the church accidentally. And in the courtroom, his brother got up and hugged her and forgave her. Ah. Uh, That's the, yeah. that is a, uh, yeah. we, we want to yeah. be like, like Michael saying, we want to be Christ, like we want to live like that young man was doing. Yeah. And so it's possible. Yep. I mean, we can obtain that yep. and we got to work for it. Mike said we're going to start, but that's a real-life example of someone actually living uh, yep. the Christian example. I mean, that's 100%. But what if that person, what if that guy had to see that lady every day, or every right. three times a week at services? What? I'm right. Not, that's that's yeah. where it really, but that's, that's, that's a big sacrifice <laughs> to go yeah. up and hug somebody. But when you have to deal with somebody working in, right. like, whatever, <clears throat> whatever we do, you know, Al-Qaeda work, that, yeah. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's. We need to realize this. This thing would take time. Absolutely. Paul would have yep. to prove yep. himself, and he would eventually. Yep. Uh, but you know, when you read in First Corinthians 15, Paul never got over this. He said that I'm. I feel like I'm the least. Least of these. Yep. Because I persecuted the church. Yep. I mean, it weighed on him. him yeah. Absolutely. But that's why Barnabas would come and they were afraid. And then when Paul would prove himself, finally he, he uh, you know, it takes a while. Yeah. And so, but when you think of this, you're talking about extreme. I know brethren that get mad at each other over nothing in the church. The color of the carpet. The church, yeah. <laughs> personality. Yeah. And, and For sure. you think that what the church of the first century came through in all of these persecutions and other things they were going through. And then you look at the church today and see people get mad. Over petty things. Leave the church yep. because they're upset at one of the elders or the preacher didn't preach right or, uh, you know, whatever. It, it, that, that bothers me. That perspective, it. right? Yeah. And then what it does with, with uh, people like that. Because they had a reason to stay away from all. Right, right. I mean, they had a, they had a real good reason. They were fearful. Yeah. He proved he finally he proved himself, and finally he was accepted by the church. Yeah. But like you said, it still weighed on him. All right. Verse 24 of Galatians 1. It's the last one we've got in chapter 1. And they glorified God in me. So those that heard of and learned of Paul's conversion in the region of Judea. We're giving God the credit for such a tremendous change. The ones glorifying God for this change were those in the churches of Judea. Paul is pointing out that those congregations were giving glory to God for the great messenger of the gospel that Paul was and had become. But on the other hand, these churches in Galatia were quickly questioning and departing from what Paul had previously taught them. Paul seemed to have a better connection, or at a minimum, those in Galatia knew Paul better, yet they were the ones that were questioning his authority and his teaching as an apostle. All right, that wraps up chapter one. Does anybody have any comments or questions in what we've covered so far in chapter one? Not about Jeffrey Dahmer, though. Sorry. Really high level, what's that? Or the Chuck Rose. No, no potluck after, after morning services. Really high level outline of this letter. Remember, both chapters one and two are dedicated to defending Paul's position as an apostle. The first 10 verses of chapter two are all about Paul's interaction with the other apostles. 
Let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Galatians 2, verses 1 and 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Paul starts off verse 1 talking about a visit to Jerusalem after a span of 14 years, which would likely be 14 years since his conversion. Another possibility, though, to consider is that it could be 14 years after his first visit that we talked about last week in verse 18 of chapter 1. We talked about that 15-day visit um, to Jerusalem three years after his conversion. We know from Acts, uh, at the end of chapter 11, beginning of chapter 12, that Paul visited Jerusalem a second time, but that visit was very brief. Uh, Jerusalem was in turmoil, as this is when James, the son of Zebedee, was uh, son of Zebedee, was beheaded. Say all that together, and Peter was thrown into prison. We read of that at the beginning of Acts chapter 12. This visit, the one referred to in verses one and two of Galatians chapter two, 14 years after Paul's conversion, is the one that we have recorded in Acts chapter 15, his third visit to Jerusalem. We also read in the second part of. Verse 1, that Barnabas and Titus were with him. And we're going to see in the coming verses why Titus was a critical member of this group with Paul. We read there in verse 2, Paul's reasons for visiting Jerusalem. In the Galatian letter, it's, it's slightly vague. At the beginning of verse 2, it says, because of a revelation. And then towards the end of verse 2, it reads, lest by any means... I might run or had run in vain. At the start of Acts 15, though, we're given more detail. We won't turn there. I'll just read the first two verses of chapter 15 of Acts. I have it in my notes here. Acts 15, verses 1 and 2 say, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore... When Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So there in Acts, verse 1 tells us specifically that circumcision was the question that was being debated. And then verse 2 there, we learn that Paul and Barnabas were there to make sure that the teaching was consistent among the elders and the apostles that were meeting. Focusing still here on verse 2 of Galatians chapter 2, it says that Paul privately met with those that seemed to be influential or those who were of good reputation. In a moment, we're going to talk about who these influential people or reputable people were, but let's look at the next question that I've got on the sheet there. Why would Paul meet with these influential people in private? And what type of application can we make or what situations should we handle in a similar manner? Why would Paul meet with these people in private? Well, you don't want to cuss them out in public if you don't know exactly what they're teaching. You don't want to cuss them out in public before you go to that cell and try to correct them. It's what you think is a mistake. So calling people out just immediately in public without really knowing the full story is not a good policy is really what you're... Yeah, that's pretty solid, Matthew. You don't really want to get the, the, the trouble, that the possible trouble involved in the whole congregation either. Too many people involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there situations or things that we should handle in this type of a manner? Jason, you know, you know in the business world, you, you know about, and you can understand <laughs> A lot of times you, you'll go talk to the executives about, in your work, we talk about socializing things. Uh -huh. You know, when I'm talking to these people, you're going to share it with them so that they are well informed that you're not talking to them a bunch of nonsense that's contrary to what leadership goals are. In like manner, you know, you bring them on board. Yeah. In like manner, yeah. Right. Yep. Bring, bring you do it one on one. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. In terms of what, I'm not a, I'm not a threat. Do you think, uh, I might be reading it, do you think that those being in a leadership role when it says there at the end, or had Ron in vain, I just wondered if the leaders wouldn't have been on board with 
the message that he had been wasting his time? So I think a couple things, you know, in vain there. I think it, it goes hand in hand, really, to have this discussion in a public way. He'd been doing this, there's this 14 year gap, right? Have this discussion in a public way with a whole bunch of other bystanders involved in vain. Well, if, if they don't align on this and if they don't realize that they're all teaching the same pure gospel, then all these people around them that hadn't been circumcised, all of a sudden, now they're like, whoa, wait, you've been telling me this for a, a decade or more and now I'm not okay? So I think there's doing it in private, let's make sure we're all on the same page, that leadership group there. And then the in vain part is, if we're not, if the outcome wasn't what it was that we read in Acts chapter 15, then we got a problem that's going to involve a whole bunch of converts. So I think, I think the two go hand in hand. At least that's the way I read it. Praise publicly, criticize privately. Praise publicly, solid. All right, let's move on to verse 3. Verse 3 says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. In this verse, it's revealed as to why Titus was a critical member of Paul's group there. Titus, in a sense, is a test case that Paul brought along with him. Titus was a Greek, thus a Gentile convert to Christianity. That brings us to the next question that I put on the sheet. Why did Paul circumcise Timothy, but not Titus? Before we answer that, we should turn to Acts 16. Turn over to Acts 16. And we'll familiarize ourselves with the Timothy situation in the background there before we get into that particular question. Acts 16, and we'll read the first three verses there of Acts 16. Acts 16, 1 through 3. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. All right, back to the question, why circumcise Timothy and not Titus? Here in Acts, you've got Timothy going into an area where his influence may be hindered, and it was an optional matter. According to Paul, it was he could do it or he couldn't do it. He did it for, for the cause of the influence. So that wouldn't be the first thing that they brought up when he went into that region. And, and over here in Galatians with Titus, uh, they were making that and not an optional matter. They were pressing upon that as a doctrinal matter. And they were forcing that. And Paul said, no, we're not going to yep. do that. So one had to do with influence. And one had to do with uh, a false conception of, of, of uh, a command. So one was expedience, and the other one was a doctrinal matter. That not was it wasn't just a doctrinal matter, but they were trying to bind it on on other people. And don't you know Titus was was happy? He was with Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and not with Peter. I would. Peter could have given it I would be too. How old would Timothy been in this? Do you know? That they say that he was in his 30s. Yeah. It's like Jeffrey Dahmer related. All right. Let's read verse, go back over to Galatians. Uh, we'll read verses 4 and 5. Galatians 4, I'm sorry, Galatians 2, verses 4 and 5. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Verse 4 talks about false brothers that were secretly brought in. And the purpose for these brethren were that they might bring those that were free in Christ back to the bondage of the old law, the Jewish law. A few things we should note about these brethren. Uh, they were brought in secretly and their motives were not pure. These false teachers were trying to drag Christians back into the rituals of the Jewish law, circumcision in particular, we've already noted. Notice in Paul's writing the verb tense of the false teachers intentions uh, toward the end of verse 4 there. 
The New King James says that they might bring us into bondage. In the New King James, this is clearly a future tense. Being in the future tense acknowledges that those following Christ were in fact enjoying freedom and and that freedom is found in Christ. And this turning away to the false teaching hadn't fully taken place. These false brethren had not necessarily won and taken the Galatians away from the liberty of the gospel and back into the bondage of the old law. Paul goes on in verse 5 to say that these false teachers, we did not yield even for an hour. I looked at the few major English translations, and most of them have not even for an hour. And such a specific time frame made me pause and consider the next question that I put on the sheet. What is the significance of not even for an hour that Paul uses in verse 5? What's the lesson for us in seeing such a specific time frame mentioned here in verse 5? I think it's not giving in at all what he's talking about. I so not even 15 minutes? Yeah. Not he 45? Gives, yes, he says not even for a moment. Not even for a moment yeah. at he, all. He wasn't going to give in at all because this was the time they should have known. This is, this is 14 years. This is several years after the Gentiles had been accepted into the church, and they were going around causing this problem. And so he wasn't going to give in to that, to that you know, like he had Timothy circumcised just to please him. But now the time had come, you know, and it takes it takes time, and now the time had come that he was putting his foot down. I'm not going to do this. You're not going to. And when you talk about that bondage, remember Peter said when he, when he, when he came to uh, Jerusalem over this circumcision thing, why put a yoke around the neck of the people? Talking about the Old Testament yeah. law. Yeah. So that was the type of bondage, bondage. that he was talking about. There. Thanks, Jimmy. I think it's an important lesson for us and and it's an important lesson for elders that by going along with permitting false teaching even for a short period of time you're you're opening that window if you will for people to to fall away and paul's very emphatic here stating these false teachers didn't even see a window of hope or opportunity go ahead mark you know that's that's bring that into an example in our in the congregations today you know, there's a lot of congregation of bringing these, these false teachers on, on one issue to talk about another issue, like, like, like a marriage seminar. You know, these guys are really good when it comes to marriage. Well, okay, but they're, they're preaching. Are they sound when it comes to divorce and remarriage? Maybe they're not sound in other areas. Yeah. And I, that the principle's right there. I mean, you can't, I mean, if somebody's teaching faults and won't be, won't adhere to the truth, you, you don't want an influence in your congregation. Yeah. And you know, how did those brethren that secretly brought in, what was their aim? Well, their aim was to do the same thing. It was to, it was to bring that false teaching in and they didn't, they couldn't do it in the front door. So they came in the back, the back door. door. Yep. That's how this stuff gets started a little bit. Just a little bit. Turn over to Romans chapter 16. We'll look at verses 17 and 18. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. The New King James says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. Avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Paul tells us here to watch out for those that might cause division or teach something contrary to the gospel. Here in the New King James, Paul says to note them. But in the King James, it says to mark them. Paul also instructs us to avoid them. He says these people don't serve Christ. They serve themselves. And this would clearly apply to the Judaizers. It would clearly apply to what what Mark just referred to. Turn over to 2 John. We're going to keep going. 2 John, yeah, on on that point. That 
in the New Testament, it's just avoid them, but in the Old Testament, it's kill them. Right. I think it's kind of where Lynn's question came in earlier, like where we were, you know, taking yeah. off the church, or, you know, this, these were people that were teaching false doctrine that probably had been Marked confronted them. already, yep. saying, hey, you need to change, and then they were avoided. You yep. know, a person that's baptized and becomes a Christian and is working through some of their sins and yep. trying to, if we can see that they are trying to stop doing those sins, that's where I think the difference is here that... And those in, in, Galatian, in the Galatian letter, they're referred to as brethren. So they, they fall into that category, whether they were, you know, I don't know that brethren, if it's a Christian brethren or if it's just brethren, but they're referred to by Paul as brethren. And so whether they're erring brethren, but at some point along the way, they're brethren. So in 2 John, if you read verses 9 through 11, Whoever transgresses, we referred to this a couple of classes ago. I don't think we turned to it. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. And then verse 11, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. We'll do one more along these same lines. Go over to Titus chapter 1. Titus 1, also verses 9 through 11. Titus 1, 9 through 11. Holding fast, <clears throat> the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convict those who contradict for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. <clears throat> In this context, we see among the qualifications of elders, that they must be able to exhort and to convict those that contradict God's words. And Paul even here mentions those of the circumcision in verse 10. So that's, that's my thinking in terms of the eldership being able to do this as well. All right, I might have exhausted verse 5 a little too much. Anything else on verse 5? Well, you guys are watching for people coming in any, any turn because, you know, you've mentioned this before, you know, when we when we study, we gotta be careful who we go by study. I know you know there's a lot of information out there, and I think sometimes people look at videos of you know denominational preachers and stuff um, and get some silly ideas that, that can be that can come into the church. You know, or the you know the the dang, Google a topic that you yeah, hear that you, yeah, and and any type of religious teaching is okay. I, I, you have to have some, I think. Solid foundation before you just randomly yeah, the search things. In is quite, sometimes can be a little bit obvious, but in turn, you might know some people have been around for a while and they start looking at things that you've got to be careful there. I don't know. We're not going to get into verse 6. I've got so many notes on verse 6. We'll just go ahead, John. An example here where we had a couple that wanted to. to place membership here and they were in an unscriptural marriage mm -hmm. and um, you know when we showed them the scriptures what the scripture says about divorce and remarriage they had a different take on that yeah but they were I don't, I don't know how to put this not beside themselves but they were they were kind of shocked that the eldership here would not allow them to, to be part of this congregation while they were in that situation. Yeah. Uh, they said, how can you deny us worshiping God is basically what they said. You know, we, we want to worship God and you're denying us that. And, you know, we shared with them about what God's word says about this. And even though they didn't agree with that, you know, it, we still had to 
to uh, buy by what God's yeah. word says. Yeah. And then a lot of times they will seek out somebody that's fine with that teaching and that's, yep, it won't take long to find, unfortunately.